the Vox Markets podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Welcome to the podcast on Wednesday the 5th of May 2021. On the podcast today, Vin Maria, OBE, serial tech entrepreneur, discusses her impressive, so impressive investment record and latest project, Advanced ADVT. Tick there is ADVT, where she is chairman and has just raised £130 million to seek a mid cap acquisition opportunities in the software sector. It's been described as the biggest raise by what is effectively a cash shell ever on the stock exchange. Plus, Christian Taylor Wilkinson, chief executive officer of Altona Rare Earths, explains their decision to proceed with acquisitions of the Monte Muembe Rare Earths project in Mozambique. And at the end of the podcast, I have two lists for you. The top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours and the top five most read RNSs. By the way, you can check out both these lists at voxmarkets.co.uk. We'll see lots of other content. In fact, there's a Bulletin Boards Heroes, the 5th of May by Zach Mir. And a uh, technical analyst look at the chart of several companies. In fact, what is he looking at today? Uh, Afritin, Alpha Growth, Bion, Botswana Diamonds, Clear Leisure, Edenville, Get Tech, uh, Panther Metals, and Trinity Exploration. Also, Get Tech. Groups H2 Green Supply, that's a big rise today. Uh, Francesca's written an article about that. I3 Energy article there. There's one on Oncumune Holdings, of course. Um, the Totally CEO Wendy Lawrence discusses the company's success with Paul Hill. Check that out. And always check out the COVID 19 index. Biggest rise there. G. Oh, just disappeared. What's Gfinity? Um, oh, Totally is there. And Tech Capital, 15% up to 1325. Biggest fall of the day, Gene Drive, down 9% to 75 pence. Check that out at voxmarkets.co.uk. Vox Markets is an online community of investors that runs a free mobile and desktop platform that allows you to track news and updates about any UK-listed company. Offering RNS push notifications, detailed charts, pricing data, and much more. Find out more at voxmarkets.co.uk forward slash app. And joining me on the podcast right now is Vin Maria, OBE, serial tech entrepreneur and chairman of Advanced ADVT. The ticker there is ADVT. Vin, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, it's very exciting you coming on because I think it was, it was touted as the biggest SPAC in the UK as a special purpose acquisition company, of course. Uh, you raised £130 million in March uh, to, for this strategy, and we were going to discuss the strategy, hopefully. Uh, and so it's very exciting. So before we get into that, though, I think we couldn't go you know, without talking about what we've done in the past because uh, I, I know a lot of people will know about that, but people may be listening, uh, maybe not aware of that. So let's start off. Before we get into your, your, your current sort of, uh, business. Let's talk about what you've done previously and uh, how most people know about you, if you could, Vin. Okay, so um, those who know me will know that I spent most of my life in the software and technology space, over 30 odd years. And I have been involved with three key businesses um, where I played a, hopefully a very prominent part. Um, the very first one was a business called Keywell Systems, which I joined in 1986 as a young graduate, would you believe? Uh, ended up as a group COO, and we ended exited at a market cap of 1.2 billion in um, in March 2000. And I joined the business at 3 million market cap, and was very instrumental in terms of both the the organic growth as well as the M and A growth. Literally from the age of 23, 24 onwards, I was taught by a maps, absolute master, a gentleman called Kevin Overstall, mm. who was a mathematician from Cambridge and had spent 30 years as a management consultant growing great businesses. So I was very, very fortunate to be taught from day one the good and the right ways to run a business rather than learning any bad skills. And that's literally what I followed for the last 30 odd years. So I joined Keywell as a salesperson, ended up as their group COO for the, uh, globally. We became one of the most prominent uh, stocks in the 2000 period. And, um, and I was very fortunate to sell all my equity in March 2000. Um, at around that 1.2 billion valuation. Uh, Key will still very much exist. It's called Blue Jay. It's now owned by Private Equity, some San Francisco partners and uh, GIC. So, um, you know, still very much thriving and growing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the second business. Now, the interesting thing about that one was, even though I did an Im- 
pretty much a hell of a lot of the work and everybody was I mean Kevin Overstall actually said to me he said uh, we all knew that I'd done all the work but I wasn't getting the credit the truth was the men were getting the credit and I didn't like it particularly so and Kevin remember saying to me he said well you know what you know you did it I know you did it go show the buggers you did it so um, <laughs> so I ended up <laughs> so I ended up taking all my money off the table <clears throat> handing over the business over the next 12 months or so and uh, in September 2002 I was locked out for a year, so I couldn't do very much. But I, September 2002, I ended up starting again with a new business called Computer Software Group. Yeah. And uh, took a shell that was worth about a million quid at the time. And over the next three, four and a half years, built it up, took it private with HG Capital in um, in 2007, and then merged it with Iris and ended up selling for 500 million in two, July 2007. Wow. So and so, if anybody remembers those dates, it was the third of July, two thousand and seven. Uh, the world was crazy. Even I thought it was crazy. In fact, it was a bit like now. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, everybody was throwing money at you, and there was a bunch of going. And we literally had built a business from nothing and sold it for five hundred million in four and a half, five years. Wow. Now, interestingly enough, for some reason, I don't know why, it, the business got bought by Hellman and Friedman, the U.S. private equity firm. It still exists. It's now. It's, it's still called Iris now. It's owned by HG and a bunch of others. It's a. It's valued at 1.8 billion now. It's a very big, great business. But interestingly enough, um, at the time there was because of the merger, um, I had the opportunity if I wanted to. I mean, it, it wasn't offered to me, but I I could see there was an opportunity to step away and do something else because when you have a merger, there's always going to be a battle for that top role and. The, the, the two individuals involved, myself and one other gentleman, great, we're great friends and we're great people, but we're different kind of, I'm a, I'm a drive it from the front, grow aggressively and move and, and grow through M&A and organically quickly. And he was more of a manage the, the business very tightly. And so it's like, you know, um, mismanagement in terms of the, uh, the potential joint relationship. So, you know, I just said, look, guys, love this business, great business, but you know what? I'm, I'm, let me take all my money off the table and I'll go off and do something else. Mm-hmm. And that was July the 3rd, 2007. So I took every single penny off the table. And of course, the, we all know what happened from there on in. The world crashed from, you know, from there on in. And I had to, again, was locked out for a year, couldn't do anything. And all I do in my world is I work out what I would have got if I'd stayed at that business because it was going to be su- success. I knew it was going to be success. And then I go and give myself a target to go and beat it somewhere else. Yeah. And so I took the money and started another business in September 2008, which was, as the world had crashed, I just saw the opportunities arise. Um, September 2008, and and literally uh, grew that business over the next five, six years, sold it first time around to um, to Vista Private Equity in uh, March 2015 for 763 million. Um, both CSG and Advance had given all the shareholders at least a 10x, or the, sh- the early shareholders at least a 10x, and um, and then the business has just done phenomenally well, and it was resold in 2019 for two billion, and it's still growing very, very well. So, so you might why, ask why have I called it my next one, uh, Advance Advance? Well, because I'm so boring, I couldn't think of the right names. Um, I, you know, Computer Software Group, Advance Computer Software Group, and Advance Advance. So that's that's it. As simple as that. Um, so from here, then, uh, Vince. So let's talk about Advance Advance. Oh, Advance Advance T. Uh, you know, you've got a heck of a record. Are you looking to beat that record? I mean, and what's the strategy if you are? It's exactly the same strategy. It's always the same strategy. I don't. I, I'm. Anyone who knows me knows me. I'm really quite boring. I do the same thing over and over again. The truth is, I look for great businesses uh, that are generally software business, or there's an, an opportunity to transform something into being a digital software business, mm. where there's high recurring revenues and very sticky customers and lots of free cash flow, and the opportunity to cross sell and upsell to do something really quite amazing with it. And generally, where there are high barriers to entry, i.e., once you're in, it becomes it's mission critical to the organisation, so therefore they can't really go. And ideally, where it's founder owned i.e. where the organization and one reason I want founder owned is because if you buy something from private equity they've they've leveraged it up to the eyeballs and not necessarily always invested as well as they might have done um, but they would have got a great return on the business founder owned businesses the people tend to look after the business really well you know they look after their customers and their people and their culture and they often the one thing that often happens is 
when they've created something amazing, they get concerned about losing it. So therefore, they don't grow the top line as much as they might have done if they were more risk averse. But those businesses are perfect because they are the customers tend to be very loyal and, and, the, and the employees tend to be fantastic. So if you can build on that through a combination of you know some kind of organic growth and some growth story around the M&A it becomes a really great play, place to be yeah yeah and how does that work so, so, the foundations are fantastic yeah 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 how does that work then do you have a, a sort of a short list or have you got your eye on one target or how does that work well I I, I mean I I'm, I'm reasonably well known in the market so I spend all my time talking to great businesses I'm a very very privileged to say that I can pretty much pick up the phone to anybody pick the phone of course anyone and they will they will speak to me hmm. and so I'm very fortunate that I get to speak to great people. It has to be at the right time. You know, people need to, to want to do something at an appropriate time. It comes to where they are in their life cycle and, you know, where they where their ambition lies. Um, so you can't force anybody to do something, but you can just give them some ideas about what is possible with their amazing business and, and then let them come to you. And that's all I do. I mean, I'm not – my job is to help somebody take their business and, and just put it on the next platform – uh, it, it's not to recreate something, you know, just to run it as it is. And if they, if and a lot of people have great ambition, they just maybe just want to take some money off the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned back there then, you said it's very similar right now to 2007 where people are throwing money at everything. And uh, does that worry you? And, uh, you know, how do you create the value in a sector where value, I mean, tech, American tech has had a bit of a sell off, but it's, it's still a bit frothy, isn't it? Yeah, it is very frothy. And to be honest, you have to be very ultra careful in these particular markets. And, and it's that old you know, dynamic, isn't it, about when do you get out? So, so what I tend to do is I look for businesses whereby they haven't managed to get onto that trend for a variety of reasons. They maybe haven't moved the product onto the cloud as yet or, they, or the founder hasn't been as risk, uh, ha- is risk averse, so therefore they haven't put the kind of development money into it. Or There'll be a bunch of reasons, not because they're negative businesses in any way, shape or form, but because they just didn't get on that track. And there's an awful lot of hype about certain types of sectors like the fintech space and the you know uh there are certain and SPACs generally in the states as it were you have to you always have to be cognizant of the that if that's what somebody wants then they're not they're not your target okay and uh, as i always say to people i want to do something that is fabulous and interesting and adds great value and i and i may never be a you know, a, a pile them high and spack them out kind of thing, kind of person. Mm. But then I don't mind. You know what? That's not what I want to do. What I want to do is I want to take a fabulous founder-led business and make it with the founder, ideally, if, if they want to be in the in the story, make it into something that we're all proud of going forward. And that's, you know, I always work on each principle. Every one of my businesses still thr- thrives to this day. And a good testament to you as an individual and to the team, actually, not just me. I, I couldn't do any of this without my teams, is that the businesses go from strength to strength when you're not there. And and that if you get to do that, then you know you're doing the right job. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So you raised $130 million. Were you happy with that? Were you surprised by that? We, I mean, to be honest, what actually happened was we had a great deal lined up and then for a variety of reasons it uh, it moved to one side. Mm-hmm. And the institutional shareholders just said, look, Vin, we know you're going to do a great thing. Why don't you just take the money anyway? So we could have taken a lot more, but, you know, there's no point having a load of money. I don't want to waste anyone's money. What My bottom line of it is I want to do something amazing. If we can find the right amazing thing to do, then thank you. We will do it. Yeah. If we can't, I'm not going to waste your money. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Have it back. Yeah. And uh, I... I've been very, very fortunate to be incredibly successful and have made an awful lot of money. It's not about the money. It's about doing something fabulous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, did, did you put some money in? Yeah, of course. I've got 20-odd million quid in it. Wow. Okay. And uh, who are the sort of main institutional backers then, Ben? Um, all the normal names that you can expect, you know, BGF, um, Marwan are involved. Um, excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Artemis, Canaccord, Amati. Mm-hmm. Gresham, mm. some big, big investors. And I'm really delighted. I mean, I'm super delighted that they were so supportive. But, you know, I work on the principle that, yeah, I'm a fantastic person. I'm a great personality, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, people back you because you make the money. And uh, 
and and money always follows money. So we're going to do our damnedest to get the right kind of thing in, in the right place, and then we'll go for it. Yeah, yeah. And have you got any sort of previous colleagues from uh, Advanced Computer Software joining you? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and we're very incredibly. I, mean, I have to say, when I left Kiwal, they, a bunch of people joined me to CSG. Computers and from Computer Software Group, they came to Advanced, and from Advanced, they're coming here. So we've already got three or four people already lined up. In fact, I had a team of ten lined up, and they're all sitting in the background helping me find deals. But as and when they're ready. And when we find the right things and if it's the right thing for them to be involved, because what I don't want to do is displace the current management team if they are the management team that should be running it. You know, yeah. the, uh, the uh, my team is there to support, not to not to take over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and they say do you, you're going to wait until the right time. Do you have a, a time pressure on you at all? Do you feel like you have to do a deal by a certain time or not? No. Hmm? I, I mean, the reason I don't is because I, I've been around an awful long time and I, I, there, there is no get rich quick, quick, quick scheme here for me. Mm. I've made more than I can ever spend in my lifetime. Um, or in fact, in the next five generations of a lifetime, who the hell cares about that? What I'm really interested, can I create something? Can we do something amazing? Can we do something that will grow the next one, two billion valuation business? And if we can do that, let's do it with great passion and energy um, and make everybody involved proud of what they've achieved. Yeah. And yes, People will make money because that's the nature of the game. You know, if you do the right things, the right things happen. Mm. Um, but the bottom line of it is, uh, the, is to create a great business that we can be proud of and enjoy the, the cycle and and deliver something that is uh, will thrive going for the for the ten years after we've left. Yeah, absolutely. But but surely, you, 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 yeah. have you got anything? Do you think it's going to happen before the end of the year or the next next two years? Or? That's what I'm going to try and do. But I mean, I'm not making any promises because I don't want yeah. people to think that I'm egg, I'm prom- over promising. I will. We are actively working on lots of things. Yeah. And with with. With God's blessings, we'll get something. Yeah, it's got to be quality. Cool. All right, then, well, listen, every day in the podcast, I highlight uh, the top five most followed companies on Vox Market. Uh, to get on that list, of course, people have to hit that follow button. So please uh, give three reasons why someone should hit that follow button and add you to their watch list, please. Uh Track record, track record, track record. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> ben, it's been good to talk to you, and uh, hopefully we'll catch up in the not-too-distant future. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Have a great one. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waits. And joining me on the podcast right now is Christian Taylor Wilkinson, Chief Executive Officer of Altona Rare Earths. That's A&R ticker. Christian, thanks for joining me. Uh, morning, Justin. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. And uh, I see you're progressing well with the, uh, one of the projects here. You've decided to proceed with the acquisition of Monte Moembe. That's the rare earth project in uh, Mozambique, and we'll discuss that in a bit. But as always, it's not the only thing you've got going on there, Christian. Could you just summarise Altona Rare Earths for people not familiar, please? Yeah, of course. Um, Altona Rare Earths, uh, we're an exploration uh, mining company, and we focused on the... Uh, evaluation and development of uh, rare earth projects in eastern central africa excellent stuff okay so let's dig into this then uh, decision to proceed with the acquisition of monte muambe that's rare earth project so tell us a bit about that uh, what do you know about it and, and why have you proceeded with this acquisition then christian okay so um we signed a, a memorandum of understanding with this company uh, on the 24th of march uh, we had 90 days to complete the, the legal and technical due diligence uh, the announcement which we put out on the 30th of April to uh, the end of last week mm. um, basically said that we've completed the technical due diligence, sorry, we've completed the legal due diligence on the, the company that we'll be acquiring yeah. and also on the actual exploration license itself. Everything is fine. Um, the lawyers we're working with in Mozambique, superb. The company that we're looking to acquire, they were very, very helpful. And the project is just, it's, it's a, an exciting um Opportunity, I think, for Altona that you know we're pushing this very, very hard to uh, to to get ourselves on the ground so we can start looking at what we've got. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, so yeah, and, and uh, so far, do you have any data there uh, available? You know, to, to you to make you, that's made you you know uh, motivate you to make this decision. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so just as a quick way of background, we're 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 sort of with MOUs with with three companies in total. Mm. Um, one is a greenfield site in Uganda. Uh, one is in Malawi, the Chembe project, of which very little data uh, shows, even though work has been done previously. But, but this particular project, uh, between 2010 and 2012, the previous owners, which was an ASX-listed uh, company, 
uh, they did significant amount of work. They sort of drilled over 12,000 meters uh, of um, boreholes. Um, uh, they covered about 5% of the total area. But what they found is um, they actually weren't looking for rare earths. They were looking for fluorite or fluor spar. Mm. Um, so, so not much analysis has been done. But what has been done shows that the, the rare earth element mineralization um, is, is strong. Um, some good intercepts. We're looking at sort of an average of over two and a half percent total rare earth oxides, which is above average for for Africa for a carbonatite, a hard rock deposit. Um, so our geologist is very excited about this, and I think the key thing is well, two things really. One, um, only five percent of the project has been uh, or the asset has been uh, explored so far. So we have ninety five percent. Who knows what we might find? It could be far better he believes there are there are better places for us to drill from the from the the analysis he's done so far but then secondly uh, there are roads up to the projects so the the asset itself it looks like a very very old volcano crater so you've got to drive through a jungle to get to it mm-hmm. um, we've seen a load of photographs um, of the site and our, our geologist when he was there um, there are workers huts built toilets kitchens beds I uh, said so there's a road up there. So all the infrastructure is there. So we don't have to go and start building and spending months and, you know, tens of thousands of pounds doing all this. It's already there, ready for us once we sign this agreement to walk in. Um, and as I've always said, you know, to our shareholders, the, the plan for Altona is every penny that we can save to put into the ground in, in pure exploration. That's what we're trying to do. And I think this project has that. We we have so we have a starting point. We have the infrastructure. We just need to go in, be sensible, spend our money wisely, um, and then uh, expand the mineralization of this project to hopefully by the end of the year put out some sort of resource estimate, so we can show to our shareholders that their their investments to date have been put in the right place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so that's the next steps and the milestone is that is it to, to get that uh, resource estimate there. The next steps will be to sign the final agreement. Our lawyers are currently drafting it. Yeah. Um, it's a lengthy process. I think, you know, both sides of, the, of this agreement are are motivated to do this deal. That's the best way to describe it. Mm-hmm. Um, both parties want to work with each other. We've had lots of face-to-face meetings rather than just email exchange. You know, our, our geologist, one of our directors, Cedric Simonet, lives in Africa, he's, he's. I think part of the reason why this deal was was agreed so quickly is because of the ability for Cedric to go and meet with the current owners. Um, so the first milestone will be to sign the agreement, which they said we had 90 days from when we signed the MOU to do it. I'm hoping that we'll get it done quicker, possibly within 60 days. So it'll save us an extra month or allow us an extra month of, of work this year before the rainy season starts. Um, and I would imagine if we do. Well, when we sign the agreement, within sort of 30, 45 days from that, we'll have a a team on the ground uh, with their drills starting to um, extract core samples for us to uh, send off to Australia to be analysed in our lab. Yeah, yeah, excellent stuff. Okay, and and just give us a a recap, if you would, on your other two sort of uh, projects and assets there. Okay, I said also in the uh, what we said in the the press release from last week... um, our our first deal we signed in in Malawi, the Chambe uh, rare earth project, we're still waiting for the Malawian government to grant the exploration license to uh, Akaswiri Mineral Resources, the, the current owner. So everything's in in place there. The due diligence is is um, you know almost complete. It's a case of once the license is agreed, then we will go to um, then we will go to sign the contract with them um so i'm hoping again possibly i'd like to say 60 days but if, if, if it's just on this license and we can't predict when the government will, will issue it mm. the second project uh in uganda the greenfield site the nancoma rare earth project uh again due diligence is is more or less completed we're just waiting on for some samples to be analyzed to give us a bit more indication and we have until the 30th of june to agree whether to proceed or not proceed with that Okay. And that's it. That's in a nutshell all we're, all we're up to at the moment. Oh, finally, uh, the London Stock Exchange standard listing, um, which we have mentioned a few times, yeah. uh, we're expecting to submit the first draft of our prospectus to the London Stock Exchange, the, the UK listing authority or the FCA, uh, in the next week or so. And then we get on the uh, on the ladder uh, for, the, for the processing. So that will be 
as long as it takes for the for the process to be again maybe sort of 60 90 days yeah, yeah. so everything is going everything is going as a planned yeah, yeah absolutely okay well you know as a, as a summary and to get people hitting that follow button if they're liking the sound of this but not yet following you just give them three quick reasons christian why they should uh, add altona red earth to their watch list please Sure. Okay. Um, the company Altona, we're, we're still obviously small, very early stage. Um, I think we have, I think we have massive potential. Uh, we wouldn't be doing this. We probably would have attracted, you know, almost a million pounds of investment into the company whilst listed on Aquis, which um, is a difficult market to raise that sort of money for. So I think that shows our potential. Um, the main thing is we're in the rare earth sector. Uh, there's only three or four other listed rare earth companies in the UK. Um, it's still not particularly a, a well-known sector, but. If you if you think that basically every piece of modern technology contains some sort of or, or some some of the seventeen rare earth elements in it, you just know that the demand for these metals is firstly huge at the moment, but um, but but growing. And then I think the final reason is um, again about the rare earths. Generally, the market is currently controlled sort of ninety percent. Uh, by China, who does all the processing in the world, mm -hmm. the world is looking for an alternative source, and Africa seems to be the best place. It's blessed with with these large deposits, both carbonatite rock deposits and also ionic clay deposits, both of which Altona is 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 looking to acquire projects in. Um, and I think Africa is is the place to be, and we're there. So you know, all the groundwork has been laid. We just need to get this first asset under our belt, and then prove what we can do. Yeah, marvellous stuff. Good to chat to you, Kristen, and uh, hopefully we'll be catching up in the not-too-distant future. Thanks very much. Thanks, Justin. Good to talk. OK, it's time for the top five most followed companies on Vox Market. In the last 24 hours, they are at five. Boohoo, down 1.4% to 321. At four, Helium One, down 6% to 21.6. At three, is Kiras Mineral Resources, uh, non-mover, 25 pence. At Two, it's East Star Resources, 3.1% down to 7.75. And at one, Tirupati Graphite, that's up 5% to 106. Okay, time for the top five. Most red RNSs, they are as follows. At five, Gritland Gold, Grant Options, Chief Executive Officer. At four, Tiziana Life Sciences, um, TLSA Strategic Initiative with uh, Tekawana, Japan. Uh, at three, Argo Blockchain, post an annual report as all. Well. Uh, remote monitoring systems at two, trading update and one. It's Omega Diagnostics, positive data for Mologic COVID-19 antigen tests. That's it for the podcast. Thanks for listening. Muchos appreciados. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research.